The title today is Urban Aquaponics and Community Food Industry Development. Now, I wanted to start out with this slide that I just happened to stick in there about an hour ago. Um, I've been, I do a lot of work in, in urban areas and such and, work, and working with uh, various uh, departments. And I've heard a lot recently about this term called uh, transformation and um, about how we want to have uh, to make our urban planning transformational. I found it very interesting. So I took a moment to look and see what it actually meant uh, in the urban planning urban planning languages. And, at, and after I deciphered a few things, one thing really struck me and that it meant to reimagine urban food systems where economic activities such as food production are once again embedded into communities. That I found very interesting because that's been something Thing that I've had an interest in for a good part of my aquaculture career. And we'll get into that in just a few moments, but let's get let's move forward. Now, one question. Now, this is not a talk about technology. Let me put, put that straight. This is not a talk about technology. It's about talk about how we apply this technology that we call aquaculture. And I in Arizona. Aquaculture, uh, aquaponics is regulated as a method of aquaculture. So then, and I've always been an aquaculturist, so no, it's a, just one of the latest it, latest uh, te techniques on urban, uh, excuse me, on uh, integrated aquaculture agriculture. Uh, but this is a, a diagram that I teach in, in my aquaponics class that I teach at Mesa Community College here in Phoenix, or I should say in Mesa, which is, is a is, is a suburb. And uh, I, I'm trying to give them some concepts of how they can go into business and in using aquaponics. And this is a, a very um, popular way. I got it off the World Wide Web. You can look this up. It's called the um, it's called the uh, business model canvas. And the first thing on the canvas is the value proposition, and that is what are you bringing as far as your value? And value comes from the questions that you can answer, um, the, um, the solutions that you can bring to problems and the needs that you can fill. If you, can, if you have a good value proposition, and that will aid you in moving through the aspects of finding the correct business model to do a business because aquaculture is in most states a business. And when we're working in urban areas, this is particularly important because urban areas often have a number of issues that they have laid out in writing that you might be able to solve. And if you can solve them, then there is opportunity to do business. So let's go, for, go further. Now, I've been thinking this way since I had hair. Uh, this was in 1990 when I was the Extension Aquaculture Specialist for the University of Arizona, and I was out on 1,000, 1,000-acre farms, 2,000-acre farms, 10,000-acre, uh, 100,000-acre farms. That, that was really interesting when you had needed an airplane to fly across that thing. Um, working with farmers, um, they often growing alfalfa, cotton, etc., but they were pulling water out of, 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 of wells that were compared with was, was Clean water is a little bit salty. It was warm. And the idea is that the, these wells were running dang near 24 7. And so if you had these canals full of water, it was possible to put fish in there, hypothetically, and then raise them to a full size crop, giving you two uses of that water. And plus the, plus the, um, uh, nutrients that came from the fish. Uh, this uh, is a method of in, of integrated aquaculture agriculture. It, it still is to, back then and it still is today. There were challenges back then because the culture of fish culture was very different uh, than the culture for cotton, but it was still a good idea to work with. And I had always, while I was out there doing these things, I really wanted to like, okay, I'm working on these farms. How do I bring this into the urban area where I'm from, which is Phoenix, Arizona, to create jobs there as well? This is the business plan for Phoenix, Arizona. Every city in Arizona town has to write one of these every year. That's called the general plan. The purpose of the general plan is to 
outline everything the city wants to do, everything the city needs and wants to accomplish over the next 10 years. In this case, the, the 2015 version, and now they're coming up on the 2025 version, which they started writing now. I had the pleasure of being the vice chair of writing this business plan for the city of Phoenix. And in this business plan, we had a lot in there on urban agriculture because, and, and, and it wasn't just me pushing for it, but the city and the city leaders had determined that urban agriculture, that having a strong food system was important for our residents. And anything that's in, oh, uh, uh, welcome Dr. Fitzsimmons, it's good to see you. Um, um, Kevin is from the University of Arizona also, and we know each other quite well. So thank you, Kevin, for, for coming in. Um, where am I? Well, anyway, anything uh, that's in the general plan the city wants to see happen. And so here is part of the effort that we put forward on what are our needs as far as local food systems. And um, from the authorization in the general plan, we created the 2050, should say the city of Phoenix, not we, the city of Phoenix, um, uh, created the 2050 environmental sustainability, goal, sustainability goals, local food systems they want us to see ma maintain sustainable healthy equitable that word equitable very important thriving local food systems the goals eliminate food deserts local farmers markets in each of our cities 15 urban villages we'll get into what those are in just a moment increase urban agriculture that's a really important point because we want to do urban agriculture we want to grow fish and plants in, in, in using aquaponics in the city itself, which fits into the definition of urban agriculture. We want to adopt, adopt zoning, land use guidelines, and other policies to improve the food system. I've, been, I've listened to many um, aquaponics pr producers who are trying to grow in cities, and they don't say that the problem we have is technology. They say the problem that we have is zoning. Well, the city of Phoenix w decided that they wanted to do urban agriculture and therefore they understood that zoning and land use and land use guidelines that people could use were critical for this to happen. Phoenix has a lot of open space and, and then we're, we're 510 square miles of which maybe I'm trying to remember the number, I'm gonna say 40%, 40% of that is empty, but um, which we, you think that'd be great for urban agriculture, but a lot of it is undeveloped. We're, in, we're a desert city, okay? A lot of it is underdevelopment, uh, underdeveloped. Um, there's no infrastructure, so therefore there's no water going to a lot of, of these parcels. And the and the parts that are developed are very expensive and for sale. So therefore, if you wanted to build a farm on one, you if you did it successfully, it could be get sold out from underneath you, or the farm, the banks won't finance it because it doesn't meet what's called the highest and best use rules which banks use to, to, to understand what's the best way of using land that will get the highest return. Farms don't fit in that normally. We have a lot of food deserts. Okay, food deserts are, are, are tracks where residents live more than one mile from the nearest supermarket and healthy, affordable food retail outlet. It's more to it than that, but that's for that's the simple way of looking at it. We have 43 food deserts in Phoenix. 52% of our 1.6 million people live in a food desert. That is a challenge. Here's another diagram from the USDA Um uh, showing it, it more clearly, the red dot is where I grew up, 1923 East Broadway. Um, and it was in the middle of a food desert. I still live near this location, a couple of miles to the south. And even there, we are still in food deserts in Phoenix. It is a challenge for us. And this is one of the issues that the city identified they need to have solved as far as a healthy food system. Then we now get to see how pre this, this plan was somewhat prescient, if that's the right word. This is um, Thanksgiving 2021, and, the, and looking toward what's called South Mountain, this is um, a line of cars that were waiting to get a Thanksgiving turkey. I'd never seen this in my own neighborhood before. 
waiting to get a Thanksgiving turkey. I had to turn around just to understand, go down the street, turn the corner and go and, and look at the church and ask the question, what's going on here? And, and so the food insecurity in Phoenix was very, very high, empty shells and high prices. And then there's, of course, water. Uh, this is Hoover Dam just to the south of Las Vegas. Uh, to the left, you have the Nevada. To the right, you have Arizona. And in the middle, you have the dam and the huge bathtub ring. Water in these, in these lakes is governed by how high is the surface above sea level. And um, this water got down to the, to the level dictated by law. I think it one zero. 1075 or 1074 feet above sea level where the water, where the shortage definitions kick in and they have declaring an, an actual water shortage. And so we have, we are short in water and water use regulations are now being written and kicking in on how we manage our water from now on until if and ever the river recovers. So with all of those thoughts, is there an, an opportunity for aquaculture. You know, one of the things I've been very concerned with over time, particularly uh, going to WAS meetings, is, is how can we increase aquaculture? How can we grow aquaculture? Is there an is there an opportunity for aquaculture to meet to provide solutions for any of these needs that the city has identified that it has. Now, um, I'm going to focus, and I'm not going to go through every opportunity that's that's there. But one of the big ones that showed up in, almost immediately was vertical farms, and vertical farms are amazing things. They support. They I've been told that uh, one vertical farm can produce. Um, as much food as uh, 300 acres of farmland. The thing about them, you know, is that they're high capex. You know, that for something like this, a very high technology, make make it work. They cost a lot, and they also, um, at least the initial version. I understand later versions are working on this. They focus on certain high value food types, such as lettuce, as an example. Uh, some were hydroponics, some were aquaponics, but they all had the same fact, the same issue. And so they are going looking at building these in Phoenix in order to address their urban farming needs. But is there something else? You know, I've always been focused on how can we embed um, food production back into the communities. These are very concentrated sources of food production. But also, is there another market? Is there another opportunity where we can um, have a different way of producing food so that it's re-embedded back into communities as far as them growing food for the community or beyond? And for that, we're going to need a different technology that's more accessible. So, I uh, think doesn't want boom. There, there we go. Then we come to the thoughts of this particular professor, is Dr. Uh, Clayton Christensen. He, he's, he's gone now. We'd love to have met him uh, from Harvard University. Uh, he was the one who came up with the concept of um, disruptive innovation. I don't know if um, how many have read that concept, but it's very cool in, in, in business schools. So please take a read of that. And what he basically discovered. Um, was that um, often companies will grow and grow and grow, and, and as they grow, they, be, they lose their focus. They, they, look, they begin to focus on other markets than the original ones that they have, leaving those original markets behind, and, and there's opportunity for people to come in and fill those. Along with that concept, there's something called catalytic and innovation that does, says that when, that when you do offer these simpler opportunities, it makes it possible for other people who have other levels of resources to take part in this, and that makes social change. In fact, it's a very interesting paper. I do encourage you to read it, Disruptive Innovation for Social Change. You are, many of us are, have already taken part in these concepts. He didn't invent it, but he, but he did characterize it. And those are the community colleges. You know, the, the large universities are doing their job. They're doing their job excellently. But in doing so, the prices have gotten to have gone up, and there are people who want to go to college who simply can't afford to go to large colleges at, at times. And but the junior colleges have now allowed 
themselves to be a stepping stone. They offer excellent courses and a stepping stone to one day maybe go to the four-year college or get a two-year degree and then move on from there. But that is a perfect example of catalytic in innovation. So my thoughts, and just for our thoughts right here, what would happen if we were to downscale a vertical farm and put it in people's backyards? Now, that's just, no, that's not exactly accurate, but it gives you a vision of what we're going to be talking about now for the next few days. So a few years ago, when I was, we were thinking about this, um, we noticed that there were these um, splash pools all around town. We were trying to find a cheaper way of doing aquaponics, building aquaponics. And we saw these splash pools around town often filled with green water, um, growing mosquitoes instead of food. So wouldn't it be cool to to uh, turn them into food production systems. They'll transform them, modify them. And we now know, in my humble opinion, that we know enough about the, the, the aquaponics to design to meet the need, not fit the need to meet the design. That is, we can design aquaponics. We know all the principles. The principles don't change, but we can change how we apply them, okay, so that they can better meet the needs of the, um, uh, of the application that we want to put them at. Okay, in this case, for in urban areas. And um, the concept that we use is called design thinking. This is a paper um, uh, that was published in Aquaculture Magazine. It's available on my website. You can go look, go look it out. But, but this is the process that we use. Uh, and we basically reimagined aquaponics so that we could grow food in these splash pools. And as you see by this photograph, they actually, it actually worked quite well. And that this was taken... Um, um, okay, they, thank you. Um, this was taken back in uh, 2015 or something like that. And then we've learned some things since then, such as um, the vinyl pools are, are not food safe, you know, and so we had to put new liners inside of them, et cetera, et cetera. Also, we learned that the circular design is not particularly space efficient. And so we moved to the rectangular design, which is space efficient and works just as well as the circular design. I can go into the, the design concepts, um, but I'm not going to do that in this, in this particular talk. Uh, they are in that paper though. Um, and so now backtracking, just to reiterate, uh, our goal, our, our goal basically, are to grow more food in urban areas, including food deserts, direct access to families designed with a wide spectrum of crops. That's one of the things that you see here, and that we're doing polyculture. Uh, we are growing, not just growing lettuce. Okay, man does not live by lettuce alone, and we're not also not growing uh, tilapia in this particular circumstance. And though if tilapia and lettuce um, are the normal, are the norm, uh, but um, as one professor, there's a friend of mine mentioned recently that you might say there's a little bit of a mismatch there because the um, tilapia are warm water fish while lettuce is a cool water plant. And so we're using catfish instead um, as an experiment to see can the two, those two work together as far as temperature regimes. And it has worked out quite well. Um, available farmland is rare and far between. And when unveil available, unstable, that means we could be sold. Opportunities for diverse participation and ownership need to happen. The solution that we came up with was to activate backyards. Phoenix has a lot of backyards. It, uh, it is one of those sun-built backyard city where almost anyone who has a home has a backyard. So can we use them? They're stable. Uh, often, they, usually they are owned by people. And that is what the Backyard Garden Program is doing. The Phoenix Backyard Garden Program was a program initiated by the Office of Environmental Programs, the city of Phoenix, uh, where they are taking, took some of the rescue money and they had, they and they looked at the concept, can we put gardens in people's backyards supported by the city that will help them grow food for their families? That's the concept. And to do that, they engaged three organizations to work on the program. The first was Tiger Mountain Foundation. Uh, they do uh, normal um, raised bed gardens. Uh, Lear Garden, this, as those of you who work with wicking beds, this looks very familiar to you. If they're not wicking beds, but I encourage you to look up uh, what they're doing. And it's a very interesting concept. And of course, aquaponics. Now, they... As far as aquaponics, 
the pro, excuse me, as far as the entire program, I'm sorry. We started in three of four districts of the city of Phoenix. Phoenix is divided into 15 districts called villages. Each village, is, village has about 100,000 people, uh, and they're about 40 square miles in size. Um, these four villages were chosen for the initial project because of their, of their proximity to food deserts. Uh, Maryville, Estrella, Lavigne, and South Mountain, where I was born, raised, and currently live. Uh, as time went past, they, it has been expanded. This is the entire city of Phoenix with all of the villages, and the villages and the ones participating in the project have been expanded to also include Encanto and Central City. When you work out the land area, about 40% of our land area in the city of Phoenix is involved in this urban agriculture project. I really do commend the city for this. Business model. The business model is critical because you don't have the right business model, you're not going to succeed. Uh, the business model that we chose, we looked around them like, when was the last time we had a successful urban farming business model? It turned out to be a long time ago during World War II, and they were called the Victory Gardens. Uh, the purpose of Victory Gardens was to provide food for the populace while the big farmers sent the food over to the, over to the um, war effort. Uh, and they were originally called war gardens, but thanks to, uh, this is the uh, anecdotal information, but thanks to the um, writings of Dr. George Washington Carver on the victory of gardening, um, they, they were changed into the now more appropriate victory gardens. In 1945, 40% of, of the food in the United States was provided by these victory gardens with an average of eight hundred pounds per family. Now, even today, to grow 800 pounds of food in a more traditional manner uh, takes 1,600 square feet. While in Phoenix, we only have, on average, 400 square feet of arable land in backyards. So can we use a little bit of the 21st century match of the volcaponics to change this and produce more closer than 800 pounds. In addition, this is a graph that came from NPR. That's where I got it from off, uh, off the web. I think it, it's based off the USDA numbers. And this shows what Americans normally eat. According to this graph, we eat almost 2,000 pounds of food a year on average, men and women. If you add up the numbers, about 40% of the food in both mass and type can be grown in our backyards. Oh, by the way, you see we eat a, eat a lot of sugar, by the way, and drinks. So taking that into account, it gives us a lot of, a, a lot of hope that we can actually grow enough food in our backyards to really help supplement the individual diets of those participants. So how do we go from that, that idea to this. Um, this is a plate of food that I threw together from some stuff I grew in my backyard, from black beans to uh, tomatoes and lettuce and tilapia. Naturally, I didn't grow the cheese. I have no cows in my backyard, but nevertheless, um, how can families partake in food from their own backyard so easily and efficiently and preferably low in cost. We'll get into that in just a moment. So we took that basic design uh, that we we have, we made them a little bit smaller. We put a hoop structure over them for sun screening and, to, and, and as a trellis and prefab them. Now we can build this entire aquaponic system turnkey in two hours. And that is very helpful to the families as long as they, ha they have the land. The, the city of Phoenix pays for everything. And um, all the farmers got, got to do is grow the food. And mind you, these are all, almost all of them are novice farmers. But even with that, they can't, they have, for the first year, have actually done quite well. Not perfect, but quite well. As you see here, again, with, with polyculturing, you see basils and melons and all kinds of things growing in there along with, um, in this particular case, I think they had catfish. Result, results, very quickly here. Okay, we currently have 43, 43 of these farms functioning and the 12 getting ready to be built over the next couple of weeks. Equity, everyone is taking part. 
Our, our farmers represent every community in the areas where the farms are. White, Black, Latino, LGBTQ, you name it. They all are represented, which is what the city wanted to see. Growing a lot of different types of food. Everything you see here was grown in aquaponics. Here's a quick list so that we can go back and see the recording. But lettuce, Brussels sprouts, melons, peppers, cucumbers, squash, celery, garlic, cilantro, beans, cauliflower, quinoa, um, collard greens, um, onions and chives, and much more. It, we, we've been able to successfully produce in these aquaponic systems, even flowers. Zinnias do quite well, for example. The fish farming part, and I came into this as a fish farming. I even wrote an article uh, talking about um, aquaponics needs to pay more attention to the fish. Uh, the fish are part of the project. They are not simply there to provide fertilizer. If you're going to be putting all of that money into these fish. You need to have them as a product. And so we have been growing catfish, and these are this is some of the fish that our novice farmers have grown. Now they were designed to grow systems and size according to Dr. Rakosi's numbers to do about thirty pounds as far as carrying capacity. Now these are novice farmers; they didn't do that well, but and what they did do, they have. You can see these fish look great; they're a pound and a half in size and marketable. The same thing is true with tilapia. That's a pound and a half fish right there. Now, you know, the, now as novice farmers, and we learned a lot uh, as far as growing them in our conditions, which I will explain to you in just a moment. Uh, but here's one more in, important thing. Okay, the fish in this case were channel catfish. We also used uh, a, a tilapia hybrid. All of these farms are licensed by Arizona Department of Game and Fish. Every last one of them. In other, in other words, they are all licensed for fish culture. We are successfully making more fish farms, which is great. And that has amazing implications in the future. I talked about money earlier and the cost of food. One of the concepts that we were working with was that, was it possible for these farms to grow food for less than it costs to buy the same product from the supermarket? If these farms are growing food that the, uh, they will eat, if they grow it for less than the cost to go to the supermarket, then therefore there is an economic gain if they grow, if they eat their own food. Uh, we found, and we were actually sent this paper from by a friend of mine, um, suggesting that, and this is from agronomy, uh, I think it was in 2019, I think, um, but this was in Spain, showing that it, it was possible. It was possible to do this. Now we are looking to see what we have to do as far as how we manage these farms to achieve the same results. New crops, macro bracket. Now, um, we all know how difficult macrobrachium are. I did my dissertations on, on these wonders. It was an egg to plate study in Arizona. I've been working on them for a while. And one thing that I really wanted to do to explore how we could add macrobrachium to these farming systems. Um, we put them into aquaponics at Mesa Community College once, and they did well, but they ate all the roots. So is there another way of doing that? And we actually, we got an, an urban farming grant to explore putting macrobrachium into the systems, and we'll, we're going to see what happens with that work. We need more fish. Catfish and tilapia are not enough. Uh, we need a cool water pan fish. This is a bluegill, believe it or not. And it's about, I'm get, thinking about three or four pounds. It, it takes a long time to get a bluegill up to this size. But we need these fish for our aquaponics because there are people who can't eat catfish 
and tilapia are limited to warm water only. And so we need a cool water scaled panfish. Um, I'm hoping that by saying this, there'll be those who have a, ha, has some leads on this information. Um, but this is something that we're looking at. I'm looking forward to, to talking to some universities who are working in this area. And maybe this can be accomplished if, they, if it hasn't already, there might already be stocks available. I simply don't know about as of yet. Co-ops. If you're going to be going to have a whole lot of farms, you should have a co-op. You know, this is a way that farmers have been using for a century to grow more crop, to reduce their costs and reduce the prices of the crops that they grow. Is it possible to set up co-ops? We don't know, but but um, we have that there are programs that our farmers are being involved in that they're exploring this possibility. Education in schools. Um, with with the program, we have a system at one of our local grade schools. I go there every Saturday, every Tuesday morning, t morning at seven forty five, and teach a class of aquaponics to the uh, grade schoolers there. And there, and th this is really interesting working with those kids and learning a lot. Culinary. If you're going to be growing a lot of food, you have to know how to preserve it besides putting it into your refrigerator. And you also have to know how to store the food. This is uh, in my home. Is this a basement? This is a room in that basement my wife has set up. Uh, she called it our COVID room. And we she has stored there all kinds of stuff from the aquaponics, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at how we can teach these things so that to more people can take part in, in their own homes and canning and other preservation methods. This. And then building an industry. One thing that was really difficult in this program was sourcing the fish. And not surprised at that because this Phoenix is not a normal place where you would think that you would need to have a fingerling catfish or a fingerling tilapia as an example. But all of these other things you see in this photograph, you know, this came from um, a slide online by White and uh, I can't pronounce the last name, but forgive me. But all of these things are needed for a successful, for a one successful farm. If you're growing it out, you need to have someone who supplies the raw material and the feed and the brew stock and, and the brew stock who's going to run the hatchery and the nursery. And this is both plants and animals. You need someone who's going to do the basic processing, value adding, and, and wholesale distribution. This is an industry. And our villages are large enough so that there could be uh, community-based industries just like you see there in these, uh, what we call villages. Uh, they would be, or you can, of course, vertically integrate and combine certain parts, but the opportunities for an industry to be, be started is tremendous because whether or not you vertically integrate, you need all this stuff anyway. No way after the bus, you need someone to provide the to provide the services like education, you you need a policy and regulation, you need lawyers, everything for, for agriculture inside of an urban area. And so there's lots of business opportunity beyond just growing out the food. Environment. I'm trying to get to get through here real quickly. Um, oh, I'm doing oh, I'm doing okay here. This is only 11:38. I get two minutes, it tells me. Um, the month of July was hot, hot, hot. I've got a little typo there, sorry. The hottest July on record for Phoenix, Arizona, 118 degree days, 110 degree days for a month, but most importantly, the 92 degree nights. We even had the classic saguaro cacti that were dying because it was too hot at night. These plants evolved under conditions where it could get very hot in the day, but it drops down to the 60s and, and 70s at night and that wasn't getting there and it was disrupting their function and they were dying and falling over. And this made it difficult to farm at that time because in the past, our water wasn't getting hot. It was now. And that gave us some problems as far as the catfish culture um, because we think that their immune systems were being affected by water in, in the range of 92 degrees because we saw some lesions forming on the fish and we couldn't quite determine what they were. But when the temperature started to drop, the lesions healed. I've seen that in tilapia. When tilapia get too cold, their immune systems break down. And when it warms up again, they can recover. So this is that hypothesis I'm looking forward to testing. Then we have dust storms. 
the dust storms are back. This is real. This was taken in Phoenix, but I think it was, um, I think it was uh, September 1st, I'm not, if memory serves me. This is what I saw, out in the, and I didn't take this picture, but I saw this coming in. These were present when I was a child in Phoenix. Now they're back, and they do leave a mess, and we hit by hurricane speed winds. They do a lot of damage. How do you farm in 118 degree heat? This was designed for 110 degrees, maybe 118 degrees for a couple of days. Farmers are now, our farmers are now putting these thicker um, uh, shade screens on. Uh, this one here is about 70 um, percent and it has helped them tremendously as far as shading and sust sustaining their plants. Again, there's an awful lot in that I'm going through here. We're also looking at different kinds of plants that we can grow that do better in the heat, including some kind of hot water leafy greens. Hard water was a huge problem. Our water is full of calcium. The calcium uh, uh, concentrates in the water. It slows plant growth and it clogs the air stones. And there is, it's very difficult to get away from this problem. Um, it, this is the chemical that causes a scale, in, scale in your showers. We also have sodium and magnesium salts. So it's a challenge that we're working with to see what the solutions are. And finally, IPM. Integrated pest management. And normally when you think about integrated pest management, you think about cabbage loopers and, and, uh, and hornworms. We're thinking about javelina. Um, one of our farmers had uh, a, a herd of these um, come to his farm and eat his, eat his vegetables. So we have to deal with all kinds of things when we're looking at integrated pest management. Um, and a little one last thing, I think, I think the last of the slides, um, in that we are going to have, have a, a great deal of fish waste, maybe about a gallon a month. Put, we decided to put it on, on a tree. So everyone is being given the tree. Uh, we wanted to have fruit cocktail trees um, that had a variety of fruit uh, available. They weren't available because of the heat. But we got normal citrus trees of, of mandarins and oranges and lemons and such. And each farmer is getting a tree because trees just dump food on you. And so since you're going to be having a lot of concentrated fish poop, just put it on the trees. And that it might be a viable solution. Uh, we're now having the uh, fish waste um, analyzed uh, in order to see what the value of it is as, as a fertilizer.